Hello, I'm Dr. John Cruz, and today I'm going to be talking about. Hello, I'm Dr. John Cruz, and today I'm going to be talking about ADHD and circadian rhythms. And I'll be talking for about 20 minutes. If you have questions while I'm talking, you can type them in, and I will try to answer them at the end. This will be posted both on Facebook and YouTube. So I'll and. Much of this is more theoretical, but there are clear-cut, practical, valuable implications from what I'm going to be talking about today. So to start with, ADHD is strongly associated with a range of problems or disruptions of circadian rhythms. And again, circadian rhythms are our innate 24-hour, approximately day-long and period rhythms. So ADHD is strongly associated with insomnia. It's strongly associated with daytime sleepiness, with snoring, with excessively short sleep duration, and with excessively long sleep duration, and maybe most specifically and particularly what's called delay sleep syndrome. So this is where it's harder to get to sleep within an hour of nighttime or something, or bedtime. So our, our, our sleep is even if you wind up getting your eight hours, it'll be delayed relative to the external daylight, dark light signal. And in the general population, delayed sleep syndromes, and, and these are more precisely defined in a clinical situation, only about 1% of the population fit a delayed sleep syndrome, the full criteria, and well over 25% of adults with ADHD meet that criteria, which is clearly disproportionate. So that delayed sleep syndrome is strongly associated with what we colloquially call um, night owls, so people who are functioning better at night, stay up late, have trouble waking up early in the morning. And although in the ADD literature in world and individuals lives, many people associate it either with, oh, it's just that there's fewer distractions then and therefore I can be get more into my activities, or um, again, other sort of preference or choice or such factors. There clearly seems to be a genetic component to this, and it clearly, I mean, it may really be that these people's brains are functioning better and more efficiently there. It's not just that the external environment is quieter, freer from distractions from people and other things. So understanding where this evening chronotype comes from is important to sorting out ADHD. So all those factors, the insomnia, the snoring, the sleep, daytime sleepiness, short and long sleep durations that are excessive, and the delayed sleep syndrome do show some genetic influence and there's some fair amount of evidence that there are shared genetic contributors to ADHD and these different factors. Now that doesn't mean this is all completely under genetic control and particularly the evening chronotype or the delayed sleep syndrome issue. We know genetics play a huge role, but we know it's not everything. So one reason we know that is that there's an age difference in that adolescence, you know, the, the classic adolescent who sleeps till noon on the weekends or tries to on, on weekdays, has real trouble getting up early in the morning is the reason that across the country different jurisdictions have been mandating later sleep or school start times for adolescents is because there is an increased propensity for delayed sleep syndrome or evening chronotypes during adolescence and there's also a strong um, gender bias there so that men boys are more susceptible or more likely to represent this than women and again it's not just a social construct the women are better behaved and more willing to follow the rules um, there again, seems to be some innate propensity here and perhaps interesting there's preliminary evidence that suggests even the month of the year you were born in. So this is not pure astrology. This is not saying that the Gemini and Cancers are predestined to be 
evening people, but people born in June and July, at least in some studies, seem to have a greater propensity for this evening chronotype. And there's some very interesting research that suggests that the amount and length of daylight exposure in the first few months when you're out of the womb may set or shape the future direction or how your clock wind up, winds up developing. So a lot of this research has been focused on what is called the clock gene. Um, and the clock gene is considered the main gene or the master gene in how circadian rhythms get expressed, but the clock gene isn't just setting up a clock and that's all it's doing. It's involved in a lot of different processes, so including dopamine regulation, it's involved in a range of neurocognitive functions, it's involved in affecting neuronal migration, which is most to play as the brain is developing. Um, so in terms of setting up how certain um, systems, networks in the brain get designed or, or based. And unfortunately, we don't have a simple, neat little story. I mean, if, if you took biology 101 years ago, or your DNA makes an mRNA, messenger RNA molecule, and the messenger RNA makes a protein, and how you influence the gene makes you have a little a different protein and a different function in the body. But we know all of these are feedback and complicated systems and usually the proteins aren't doing just a single thing in the body, they're doing a multitude of things and having feedback can affect some other expression and interplay. So actually the, the 2017 Nobel Prize was actually awarded to a trio of scientists, Hall, Young, and Ross Bash. Um, would develop what's called now the transcriptional translational feedback loop model it's for how not just um, circadian clock in humans and across the mammals. Mammals um, it seems to be a same system in flies and across much of the animal, probably plant kingdom as well. So the transcription translation feedback loop and then and the, the genes they were focused on were two, which is the PER gene for period and another gene called timeless. So what that system, how that system works is that the transcription and transcription is when you're making DNA, reading off the DNA and creating an mRNA, a messenger RNA molecule. That very transcription is suppressed by the product that the mRNA, the, the protein product that the mRNA mRNA molecule is going to translate and form. So you have a feedback loop where the, the eventual protein product, the more it builds up, the more it feeds back and shuts off the transcription of the DNA to the MNR, mRNA and the mRNA. So it's, if it's shutting it off the mRNA, we're producing less mRNA, we're having less mRNA, then it's producing less of the protein, so it's shutting itself down. But again, that suppression, as you wind up shutting off the protein, then there's less suppression over time so that the system can build back up. So that, that is the essence or core, and I may not have explained it very well, but that is the feedback loop that seems to be the basis or the core of our circadian clock. Um, so again, it's essentially a protein product that's being produced that's shutting down its own transcription. So, so jumping around a little bit, in addition to the genetics of you know, the genes affecting our circadian clocks, um, and, in, and the circadian clocks affecting behavior, there's also some research suggesting that the medications particularly not just the stimulants like Ritalin, but also some of the non-stimulants like Stratera or Atomoxetine actually can affect the expression of particularly the clock CLOCK gene. Um, so again, that's that master gene that's involved in DA dopamine regulation and in other neurocognitive functions and a variety of, of 
sort of producing how the clock affects the circadian clock affects and sets up cycles in blood pressure and temperature regulation and all sorts of physiological processes throughout the body. So both Ritalin and Stratera have been shown to um, delay the onset of sleep and often in a clinical setting in the, in the daily world of people taking these medications in the clinic and the therapy sessions, we often focus excessively, are you taking the medication too late, too early? And because the medications, the stimulant medications will have a direct effect on sleep onset or delay. But this, this evidence is showing that it's not just a direct immediate effect of keeping alert and alert in that moment, but again, that these drugs seem to be affecting how that clock gene is expressed um, and seem to be promoting phase delay so that even nights you're not taking it or skip the medication, these effects on how different circadian clock genes are expressed may continue long after and may perpetuate some of the phase delayed effects. So part of this, again, it, at the molecular level, the clock itself isn't just a feedback loop, but at a human behavioral level, we have lots of feedback loops. So again, we may, it seems pretty clear that genetic propensities may make people more prone to insomnia, more prone to having delayed sleep, either excessively long sleep or excessively short sleep. But we know also that sleep deprivation itself or sleep restriction, where we don't completely keep someone up the whole night, but just allow them to sleep, say, six hours a night, that sleep restriction and deprivation do have direct effects on inattention, on executive function, just like and, and a single night of sleep deprivation has an effect about on the same scale as being um, legally drunk, and legally drunk varies by jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but the impairment, the troubles with recall, the troubles with memory, the troubles with organization, inattentiveness, making mistakes, again, one night of sleep depri deprivation is about as powerful as getting you drunk. And again, lots of these effects of sleep deprivation mimic or probably reinforce some of the core problems of executive function, problems of ADHD. Um, we know in some subsets of children that children with sleep apnea, it isn't particularly common in children, but of children with sleep, ap with sleep apnea, a substantial majority of those children display full robust range of ADHD symptoms. And there have been several studies where surgical or other means have been used to correct the sleep apnea in children. And in many instances, there is substantial, if not complete, resolution of ADHD symptoms. So that doesn't mean every adult with ADHD has them just because they're sleep derived or has them just because they have sleep apnea. But again, there are strong feedback loops of problems with sleep, deprivation of sleep, disruption of sleep, leading to ADHD symptoms, and again, ADHD itself being correlated with this. Um, problems with sleep, problems with delayed phases of your circadian rhythms. So all of this speaks to the importance in ADHD of maintaining good sleep hygiene, of limiting exposure, particularly to the blue end of the light spectrum, which is the light photic input to our circadian clocks is that blue end of the spectrum. Um, and that's why many of uh, the phone and other device manufacturers now have modes where you can screen out the blue end of the spectrum because that's particularly potent at resetting your clock each, each day, keeping you awake later, making it harder to fall asleep. Um, but there's a whole host of other sleep hygiene procedures, including just having a ritual for going to bed. Um, the one crucial aspect I keep reinforcing over and over is that 
You need to be doing this at the same time each day because there are two big factors determining sleep. One is a um, fatigue factor that builds up the longer you've been awake, but the other is the circadian factor. So if you're used to sleeping from midnight to 8 and you stay up playing your video game till 3 a.m., you may sleep 8 hours from 3 a.m. to 11 a.m. You are going to wind up at 11 a.m. not feeling as refreshed, alert, awake as you would have going to bed at 8. And there's been two different studies by the same group um, that use bright lights specifically. So these are lights of the same intensity used for winter depression. Um, so the lights are at least 10,000 lux, and lux is how many photons are hitting per square centimeter of surface area, in this case your retina. But bright lights delivered in the early morning to people with ADHD who do not have seasonal depression, do not have depressive symptoms, measurably have show are correlated with an improvement in cognitive functions two or three weeks into treatment. So that's about all I'm going to say today about ADHD and circadian rhythms. I see there are some questions. Um, next week's topic is adult onset ADHD. Does it really exist? And I will try to present the data and my interpretation of the data. But I see there's at least one question. So it says sleep apnea is associated with ADHD symptoms. Sleep deprivation. Hmm. Maybe blue light. So again, so I'll, I'll just expand on that a little more. Um, I, I've had at least one patient, an adult who came to me primarily for depression, was working with a good therapist for years. Um, in addition to his depression, I did uh, identify and diagnose him with ADHD because he clearly had it. This is someone who would sleep in on weekends till literally two or three in the afternoon, get up for just a few hours. Now more, some of that again was depression related. Um, for years, I begged him to get a sleep study, um, partly through ADD, partly through depression. He delayed and put it off. Um, finally got the study showed clear, robust sleep apnea. He was put on a CPAP machine. And within a few weeks, he was sleeping solidly at night. He felt much more refreshed or energetic. Didn't treat his depression, but virtually all of his ADD symptoms were treated and we could completely stop stimulant medication for him. So again, that's one anecdote. But so the question I'm seeing now is how does adult how does adult onset ADHD occur? So again, next week I'll be talking about adult onset ADHD. I'll, I can give you the short answer. My, sh my short answer is that there are some syndromes like head trauma, maybe chronic drug abuse with certain drug, certain agents can mimic adult can mimic ADHD and reproduce most of the effects. And outside of that, most of the people who are being diagnosed brand new with ADHD had it their whole life. That's going to be my take, but we can tune in next week and see the whole 20 minute talk or so on that. So stay healthy, stay happy and have a good week. That's all for now.